drug, it's a behavior. It's not the behavior. You know, we had the AIDS on McDonald's. We had the second reported case of AIDS in the United States at SC when I was a CO fellow. June 6, 1981. You don't have sex back then. Now we know it's uh, drug use and other things. You can know it was unavoidable. But the key was what motivates behavior. And that we all got from Psychology 101, right? Reward, negative reinforcement, or punishment. Now what seems to make places, it's not just one of those, but it's that combination. And that's why I'm so impressed with really the elite in addiction medicine, is it's not just about how do I make it the best reward. It's not just about how do I take away that noxious stimulus, or how do I punish it. But how do I put them together, like that delicious vegetable soup? How do I integrate? Now, we know reward is a more powerful shaper of behavior, but we also know that taking away that noxious stimulus, that, that negative reinforcement, is also important. So when we talk about dealing with stress, and we go back to the work of Hans Selye and a whole bunch of other folks, it's about understanding the marvelous complexity. And that's why I think a successful treatment program is coming. I believe that any program that is kind of myopic and stuck on one agenda will never be as successful. We don't yet know what the most important components are. And what's important to me might not be as important. Again, I was an athlete, so I kind of think like a jock, because that was my life for a very long time. I got a lot of reward from it. I got a lot of punishment because of the way you quit. I got a lot of positive reward. I know we have elite athletes in the room here. So it's that combination. What I'd like to see in the really successful treatment programs is this integration of everything. Do the science to understand what has the highest level of variance. Understand that for some people, spirituality might take on a slightly different role. Now we talk about exercise. I think exercise is great. One of the things I learned when we were doing PMS trials back at the NIH was that a woman goes through this long trial, and she says, Dr. Barron, you've really been helpful. What can you do to really help me kind of maintain my mental stability, to decrease my stress, to not be so anxious? I said, exercise is really good. There's a whole bunch of data about that. And she went, she said, well, what kind of exercise? At that point, I had gotten out of the pool. I was running. I said, why don't you try jogging? So she comes back three weeks later like this. I said, oh, shit, I missed the diagnosis. Poor woman was depressed. And I said, to tell me a little bit more about this. And she says, you know what? You work with me in the NIH Building 10. We went this thing. All this time, I asked you one question. What should I do? And you tell me to run. And she said, I didn't have the heart to tell you. I'd sooner die than run. <laughs> and I said, you know, shame on me. Now, let me try this. Give, give me a do-over. What do you really like to do? And she says, I love to dance. I said, I want you out to dance. She said, I got a problem. My husband's not real big on dancing. I pull out a prescription pad. I said, dancing? Two hours, three times a week. I said, I want you to show this prescription to your husband. If he can't help you fill it, find someone else who will. <laughs> and she laughed and came back, but she got the message. So I think treatment programs are about having people understand. It's not about fancy slides that show beautiful p-values. It's about having a patient understand what's going to work for them, and it's not a one-size-fits-all. And to me, that's the one thing I learned from my dad and my grandfather. It is not a one size that fits all. We need to understand the things that are the most important, but have this menu, as it were. And resilience, I believe, there's a biological component, there's a psychological component, there's a spiritual component, but it changes not only within individuals, but within that same individual. We go through different parts of our lives. And what I'd like to see from the research side is this integration of neurophysiology, neuroradiology, genetics, because they all affect each other. They're not three separate legs of the school, as it were. They're all three components of the same leg. If we miss one, we're not going to be as successful. And I think exercise is one of those that I had a particular interest in. Not everybody loves exercise, but everybody likes to move a little bit to have some fun, whether it's dancing, getting into a pool. So what I'd like to see, and I try to focus a bit more on the Riverman, even though I had seven other slides, we're not going to see those, is the idea of making sure that we keep a broad, open mind. That we understand that there's wonderful science going on. This was missing a bit when I went through it. There wasn't as much science. I think we had this brilliant science. And my, one of my early mentors, Dr. Pound, we had a chance to see, I haven't seen him in a while, taught me so much about addiction as a disease. This idea that they're clients, I'm a client to my bank. I'm not a client to my dentist, I'm his patient. There's, there's no shame in being a patient. Because I think some of the language we use has helped create the culture that we continue to fight 
And that's one of the issues that we need to address. We have to change the culture so that medical education is not as woeful as it is now. It sucks. We've already talked about that. Doug Zagonis runs a program. He's a brilliant guy. We need to change the culture by changing physicians and then getting out into the general population. So I want to thank everyone for coming here. I got my double click. Thanks so much. Yeah, I thought maybe we had some slides. We can probably just, uh, I'd love to see some of the other slides. Uh, we'll steal them for our presentations that we make. <laughs>